in the process of aligning the rope is, is a fallacy. You just simply hang the rope and you prepare it. You, you're, you're very discreet, however. You tie the rope against the wall. It's the victim of the state murder walked, ready, still hooded. He doesn't see the noose hanging down. It's, I, I guess it's a polite way of handling a murderer. And there are these black hoods laying there on the floor, and they take them up and they beat them against their leg and get the dust out, and now they're ready to put over a man's face before he dies. this day, when I talk about an execution, I still tend to react emotionally. There is no real way to describe the trauma that a man receives, and goes through, and experiences when he is in actually involved in seeing a man executed, a man dying, a man dying through very mechanical, methodical means. Uh, I was a lieutenant assigned uh, to the cell, directly adjacent to the electric chair. And uh, the reason for this assignment was to keep this man from committing suicide or creating bodily harm to his person. And of course, we had another officer assigned outside the door, which was locked. And uh, I think the hardest part uh, for myself, I happen to be unfortunate enough to be assigned to death row itself as a correctional officer before being promoted to a lieutenant and then later being assigned to the electrocutions. I think I became a little more acquainted with the people that were being electrocuted at that time. And uh, this, of course, made it harder uh, being personally acquainted or as well acquainted as one could be under those circumstances. The procedures actually that we followed uh, at approximately five o'clock and the yard was cleared, this man was brought from the death row itself over to a small cell directly behind the electric chair. Uh, at approximately six o'clock, of course, this man had any type of food on his request could be served to him, uh, steaks or whatever he might want to have. And, uh, of course, this was always rather hard to watch a man eat his last meal. And uh, most of them tried to do this in a very relaxed, or to give, the, give you the opinion that he was very relaxed. His oldest pre-execution ritual that really torments a man to the point that where, when he is actually executed, it's anticlimactic. Uh, I had to sit there in the cell they didn't remove my cell partner from my cell. I had to sit there and watch them shave his head and uh, lubricate his head. I had to sit there and watch him try to eat his last meal, uh, which he wasn't able to. And uh, it's, it, it, it's really bad. And back then, uh, the chair was right there, right down the road. I, I watched, that, watched them take out this man, who was as close to me as any of my brothers. And five minutes later, I could smell his burning flesh. The meal was taken out at about 7.30. And about 7.45, the two officers that were assigned to uh, the chair itself came back into the cell area, and they cut the right trouser leg of the inmate, or the man waiting execution, uh, for the application of the electrodes. And of course, the shaved at the crown of the head, uh, an area of approximately the size of a 50 cent piece, for also an electrode which, after he was placed in the chair, the electrode was placed on the head and on the right leg. We'd always talk to him about the good haircut we were going to give him and so forth, and try to strike up a conversation to get the man's mind off the electric chair. 
and they accepted it very, very well. Capital punishment is a phenomenon that you can't really grasp unless you've truly experienced it. There are two ways to experience. One is the experience as a relative of the victim or as a witness to an actual state-sanctioned execution. In my situation, and I can only speak from my own experience, is that experiences I ever had in my entire life, and certainly in my professional career in corrections, was being responsible for and obligated to attend and participate in an execution. Suddenly a whole new sequence of phenomenon develop. You are no longer outside of the system as a citizen, as a voter, as an official. You are there. You are totally committed while you're there. And you must grasp and deal with your individual emotions as they are occurring second by second. There is no way to really and truly communicate to anyone what transpires on a gut level with you as an individual. It's a dis distasteful situation. It's a hurtful situation. It's a sympathetic and empathy situation that arises. You have to deal with the reality that in, within a matter of moments you will actually see an individual die. I would just ask him for mercy, that's all. I just asked him, I would tell him, I said, Governor Regan, you got a son. And if you can save a life, and it don't take nothing but just a word from you, would you please do that and save my son's life and give him a chance? To kill him, and go bring uh, uh, the, the, uh, the policeman back when they say he killed. They're not going to bring him back. It ain't going to help none. There was no new, in nothing new introduced that would alter uh, the situation. No new evidence upon which anyone could base uh, uh, a change in the decision. I would be putting myself uh, above, if I altered this, uh, all the judicial bodies and all of the uh, appellate means that we have. I don't think that even as governor I have the right to take a life. I believe that uh, thou shalt not kill uh, applies to officials as well as to other people. I have not seen any evidence either that capital punishment as uh, a form of taking care of uh, those who in our society have either killed somebody or raped somebody or committed some other hideous crime has ever served as a means of stopping these types of crimes. There's been no correlation of statistics that show that where you have capital punishment, you also have reduced crime rates. Well, this, uh, this terror was built uh, in uh, 1897. First man executed in it was 1897. Up to 1963, there been 315 men executed in. This is a mass that uh, some people tell me it's mandatory. I don't know if it is or not, but uh, this is a mass they use. This is the original mass, original chair. This is a headrest over here. Where they, this is adjustable, any place you want to put it. And. Uh, a guy by the name of Charles Justice helped uh, design these clamps on this chair. Later on, he was executed in it himself. These are the electrodes. They shave a spot on the top of your head, and this sponge is on the bottom here. And they, this is soaked in some solution for about 24 hours prior to the execution. And they shave a spot on the top of the head and they put this electro on there and put this around here like this. And then uh, here's one they put.
put on your right leg. Just slit the, plant, the pants leg there a little bit and uh, clamp this one around the right leg. And that's all there are to the electrodes of it. All these, all these clamps are Push them down like a, used to be a, like an automobile, an old automobile, like emergency brake on a car. The farther you push them down, the tighter they get. We always try to impress on them to drink fluids, uh, water or pop, which they could have pop for their last meal. They were granted to have anything they wanted to eat or drink, with the exception of alcohol beverages, of course. But we tried to get them to drink a lot of fluid because this made it easier to be electrocuted and also eliminated the smell. Because if a man didn't drink much, they claim it dehydrated, he dehydrated, and you would get a smaller smell of burning flesh. Most of them, I think, accepted this. They have to go to the electric chair. They uh, always walked out, walked up to the chair. They, they always sat on the edge of the chair. They were never scoot back into the chair. We always had to scoot them back into the chair. The reason for this, I can't answer because I don't know, but they always, everyone I helped on always sat on the edge of the chair. Uh, in most cases, uh, most of them had been so eager for a commutation that um, I think they just finally uh, resolved the fact that they were going to be electrocuted and they seemed rather relaxed in the last couple of hours before the execution. You got home, the first thing you had to do is get rid of your clothes, put your clothes away, put them in the basement if you had it, and take a quick and take a shower because you had that smell clear through onto your hide and everything, that burnt, burnt flesh. There was quite an odor, uh, usually after the electrocutions, and you could uh, hear sizzling, and the odor was uh, quite distinct in the room. And of course, sometimes it would even uh, go into the clothing we would have to have our clothes dry cleaned on occasions. And of course, electrodes were soaked overnight. And the death house itself was aired out uh, for a couple of days after the electrocutions. I do not want and will not accept the responsibility for another. The, the sensation of an execution is one of assuming a degree of community guilt because what you are experiencing as an official in an institution, in a penal institution, in a maximum security institution, is really a social responsibility. It's something that the community has to experience and they should experience. It's a reality that if you're going to have capital punishment, the people involved must understand this, and they must grow up with it. I don't want this responsibility. I don't like this responsibility. The responsibility that I have been saddled with in my execution experience is something that I have to deal with the rest of my life. Well, this is my personal opinion, of course, and I certainly don't think that uh Capital punishment is a deterrent to capital offenses. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are, at the present time, a lot of controversy about this. And I can't see that uh, it will eliminate uh, capital offenses by keeping the electric chair. I, I don't think one thinks of punishment or being electrocuted when he's committing a crime which could result into a capital offense. So it's my personal belief that this is not certainly a deterrent to uh, capital offenses. Right now, say that they had an electrocution tomorrow, would you go up and help? Well, I would help if they needed me. I uh, wouldn't want to. I mean, I think I've had my share, but if they needed me, I, I would gladly go and help them, yeah, because it's part of, my, part of my job. I took shooting. I uh, took it because... Well, I go more or less by the Bible and ask that, but that's the only part of the Bible I believe in. You can live by the gun, you die by the gun. Well, I look at it this way, uh, I can get killed crossing the street. 
in front of a car or hit by a train and fell down a set of stairs. If they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. There ain't a damn thing I can do about it. Well, uh, I can never tell what a U.S. Supreme Court's going to do, particularly the new Supreme Court. But I would uh, hope that uh, they would come into the 20th century uh, and uh, declare capital punishment uh, to be unconstitutional and uh, by so doing then uh, force uh, Pennsylvania and all other states to think in terms of uh, other methods of preventing crime and also rehabilitating criminals.